On July 26, 1981, a heist transpired at an American bank branch in Texas, orchestrated by the notorious fugitive Forrest Tucker, a wanted man who had eluded the authorities since his prison escape two years earlier. Once his bag was laden with loot, Tucker exited the bank, heading to his white car before making a strategic switch to a prearranged blue vehicle at a concealed location. Employing a modified police radio during his criminal exploits, Tucker monitored law enforcement movements to ensure a smooth getaway. As he merged onto the highway, he overheard radio chatter indicating the deployment of several police officers in the vicinity. Opting for a diversion, Tucker halted and feigned assistance to a woman with a disabled car. Shortly thereafter, a convoy of police cars passed by. Lacking mechanical knowledge, Tucker eventually offered the stranded woman, Jewel, a ride. It was during this encounter that Tucker, using the alias Bob, learned more about Jewel, a widow abandoned by her husband for an extended period. Despite the pseudonym, Tucker and Jewel shared a meal, engaging in lively conversation during lunch. Curious about Tucker's occupation, Jewel inquired, and Tucker responded in writing. Upon reading his reply, Jewel was astonished, thinking it to be a jest, given Tucker's advanced age and well-groomed appearance that seemed incongruous with the career as a robber. Chuckling, Tucker urged her not to take it too seriously, concluding their meeting with Jewel and trusting Tucker with her telephone number. Fast forward to August 4, nine days later, when Detective John Hunt of the Texas police received a report about a bank robbery. A witness described the perpetrator as an elderly man donning immaculate attire. However, no additional leads surfaced at the crime scene, prompting the investigation to be halted. One fateful day, Forrest devised a plan to rob a major bank, seamlessly enlisting the help of his two accomplices, Waller and Teddy. Each member had their designated roles, with Waller tasked to discreetly monitor the bank's interior and Teddy positioned as the standby driver. Serendipitously, Detective John happened to be present in the bank with his child, oblivious to Forrest passing by. Forrest approached the bank manager under the guise of seeking a loan for a business venture, revealing a concealed firearm and coercing the manager into a private meeting. Diplomatically, Forrest requested the manager to fill his suitcase to the brim, a command promptly obeyed. Despite complying with the demand, the manager remained composed and discreetly activated the alarm to summon the police urgently. Once the bag was filled and handed over, Forrest nonchalantly retreated to the parking lot and made a swift escape. Mere minutes later, the manager secured the front door, alerting all customers to the recent robbery. The police arrived promptly, launching an immediate investigation at the crime scene. Meanwhile, Forrest and his associates reached a secure location, utilizing a prearranged vehicle before dispersing to their individual escape routes. Forrest, returning home, clandestinely stashed the ill-gotten gains beneath the floorboards. At the crime scene, the police sought information from various customers, including Detective John's children. However, no substantial leads emerged, except for the manager's testimony mirroring the accounts of previous victims. The manager described the robber as a polite elder. A few days later, John received a report from another city's police, detailing a bank robbery with a perpetrator matching the physical description of the individual who had robbed the American bank branch in Texas. Upon contacting the police station, John learned of two robberies occurring in rapid succession, both attributed to the same person. While John diligently gathered information from the crime scenes, Forrest, operating in different locales, continued his spree of robberies. In the same year, on September 1st, Forrest executed a solo robbery at the Norman, Oklahoma branch of the Federal Bank. Subsequently, on September 6th, he targeted a bank in Battle Hill, Missouri, followed by a heist in Little Rock, Arkansas, on September 10th, and another in Little Elm, Texas, on September 12th. Witnesses from each incident consistently described the perpetrator as amiable emphasizing that he never brandished a firearm. Remarkably, one witness even remarked that a sketch created by Detective John appeared excessively menacing, as the real culprit seemed much friendlier. Detective John, fueled by ambition to apprehend Forrest, immersed himself in exhaustive research, scrutinizing every piece of news related to recent robberies. He won all case files home, conducting a comprehensive study that led him to a resolute conclusion. There had been 93 robberies across five states, all committed by the same individual. Meanwhile, Forrest took a detour to visit Jewel at her home, where their affinity for each other became apparent. Surrounded by pet horses and expansive land, Jewel confessed that some of her property was still under bank scrutiny. During their conversation, Forrest disclosed his previous marriage but clarified that he never had children. On September 26, Forrest arrived in St. Louis, Missouri, setting his sights on the First National Bank. 
Over the following days, he, along with Waller and Teddy, observed the bank meticulously. Noticing a consistent arrival time of a money transport card noon, Forrest returned daily to confirm the schedule. On the fourth day, the trio conducted covert surveillance within the bank, posing as customers. Forrest focused on calculating the time it took to open the safe and the duration officers needed to transfer money from the car to the secure vault. Despite the debate between Teddy's pessimism about their aging agility and Waller's confidence in his successful operation, Forrest remained indifferent, retreating to his hotel room. While tuning into the news, he discovered an ongoing police investigation into their recent robberies, with Detective John expressing determination to apprehend the culprits, dubbing them the Over the Hill Gang. Forrest, amused by the moniker, decided to surprise John. The following day, John was jolted awake by news of a substantial robbery at the First National Bank, drawing the attention of the FBI due to the theft of both money and significant amounts of gold. Adding a taunt to the intrigue, Forrest left a note for John. To John Hunt, good luck John, sincerely the Over the Hill Gang. Feeling offended and more determined than ever, John longed to personally arrest Forrest. The bank's CCP footage, though blurry, captured Forrest's smile further fueling John's enthusiasm as he now possessed a visual of the elusive robber. Regrettably, John had to relinquish control of the case to the FBI, providing them with all the information he had gathered. Despite being steps closer to identifying the perpetrator, John accepted the transfer with disappointment. Fortune smiled upon John when he received a letter from Dorothy Hayes, claiming to be the daughter of the robber. Meeting Dorothy in California, John saw a glimmer of hope in solving the case and bringing the elusive over-the-hill gang to justice. During the interview, Dorothy disclosed that she had never personally met her father, as he was already incarcerated before her birth, and subsequently, there was no further communication. At the age of 15, her mother revealed to her that her father was a notorious robber. Dorothy became convinced that he was the fugitive the police had been pursuing lately, understanding his character through her mother's accounts. Her father seemed to repeat the same mistakes, claiming to have changed only to resume his criminal pursuits, treating robbery as a peculiar hobby. The charming and gentle demeanor she described matched the traits of the current perpetrator. To substantiate this evidence, John sought out Forrest's lawyer, who had been a longtime companion during Forrest's prison sentences. The lawyer attested that Forrest was no ordinary prisoner, having successfully escaped from prison 16 times, all in connection with robbery cases. Despite the lawyer's counsel to cease his criminal activities, Forrest persisted, citing his desire to save her life rather than a need for financial gain. This explained why he never utilized the gun he always carried during his actions. A week following the first National Bank robbery, Forrest visited the Texas Loan and Commerce Bank to settle Jewel's property debt. However, the process proved challenging as Jewel, the concerned party, had to be present to sign off on the resolution. Despite Forrest's explanation and attempt to give Jewel a Christmas surprise, the bank required her presence for the transaction to proceed. Faced with no other option, Forrest took Jewel to a jewelry shop and presented her with a beautiful bracelet instead. A month later, on October 13, Forrest encountered John and his wife at the restaurant where he usually dined with Jewel. Sensing the proximity of the police investigation, Forrest urged Jewel to go on holiday and stay away from Texas. Spotting John's arrival, Forrest approached him in the restaurant, exchanging greetings as if they were meeting for the first time. Although initially uncertain, John soon recognized Forrest as one of the members of the Over the Hill Gang when Forrest mentioned the ongoing investigation. Forrest inquired about the progress of catching the perpetrators, to which John responded with a smile, indicating that they were close to capturing them. After meeting with John, Forrest took Jewel home, stopping at a gas station to refill the gas along the way. During Forrest's absence to pay for the gas, Jewel discovered a gun inside the car's dashboard. Though shocked, she acted casually, refraining from directly questioning Forrest. The discovery triggered memories of Forrest's earlier confession about being a robber. Upon returning home, Forrest was surprised to find Teddy on the porch, an unusual visit. As he approached Teddy, the police ambushed them. In an attempt to escape, Forrest sped away in his car, engaging in a high-speed chase with the police. Despite managing to create distance, he sustained a gunshot wound to his arm. Employing his usual tactic, Forrest monitored the police via radio and, finding a safe spot, left his car to commandeer another. Unfortunately, in the haste, he left the radio in the abandoned car, unaware of the oversight. Forrest successfully evaded the police pursuit but had to drop off a passenger at a gas station due to persistent requests. He then headed to Jewel's place, changing his plans upon arrival. Instead of knocking on the door, 
He retreated to the horse stable behind the house and rode away on one of the horses. Shortly after, the police arrived and Forrest, choosing not to flee, resigned himself to await arrest. Prior to incarceration, Forrest received treatment for his gunshot wound at the police hospital. During this time, John visited him and returned the money recovered from the previous robbery. While in prison, Forrest contacted Jewel, providing her with the note listing all his previous escapes. He detailed escapes from various institutions, including Street James Reformatory for Boys, Florida, in 1936, Southern Points Detention Center, Florida, in February 1942, Attica Correctional Facility, New York, in November 1944, East Jersey County Prison, New Jersey, in January 1945, Red Onion State Prison, Kentucky, in July 1950, Milwaukee County Courthouse, Wisconsin, in August 1952, Shawnee Correctional Center, Illinois, in 1955, Bud Bartlett County Jail, Oklahoma, in December 1956, Huntsville Prison, Texas, in January 1957, Kansas City State Penitentiary in November 1958, an escape in October 1960, location forgotten, Lebanon Penitentiary, Ohio, Angola State Prison, Louisiana, in July 1963, California State Prison, California, in December 1966, and two escapes from San Quentin State Prison in 1979. The note revealed Forrest's extensive history of eluding captivity. After reviewing the list, Jewel noticed the number 17 and inquired about it. Forrest revealed that he had saved the last or what he considered the best escape. Realizing that Forrest intended to break out of his current prison, Jewel suggested he exercise patience and complete his sentence, assuring him that she would wait for his release. Surprisingly, Forrest heeded Jewel's advice, serving his prison term and contacting her upon his release. Following his release, Forrest reunited with Jewel, and the two began living together at her house. However, after a few weeks, Forrest sensed that something was missing from his life, finding it less enjoyable than he had hoped. Eventually, Forrest succumbed to the urge to rob once more. On his first heist post-release, he targeted four banks simultaneously. Upon his arrest, Forrest wore a smile, seemingly unburdened by regret or remorse for his actions. The End So, what do you think of this movie? Did you enjoy the recap? Drop your thoughts in the comments section below. One like and subscribe is highly appreciated. Share this video to your friends and family too. And that's about it. Thanks for watching and see you in the next videos.